All right, so cellulose. Um, because of the beta configuration, we have that one four link linkage that allow allows the glucose <coughs> molecules to be oriented in opposite directions every other glucose molecule. And that allows us to establish hydrogen bonds. And then individual molecules of glucose of uh, cellulose, which is a linear molecule, can now adhere together because of those hydrogen bonds that are that are capable. In starch, you can't do that because you can't form the hydrogen bonds. So in order to deal with cellulose from a digestive perspective, you would need an enzyme that can help you break down that beta configuration, the beta linkage. And humans and all mammals really only have the enzyme to handle the alpha configuration what we would find in starch. And that alpha configuration enzyme is not equate to an ability for the beta configuration to be enzymatically broken down. So in other words, you go and eat your salad today, and there's going to be some cellulose in that salad. You cannot digest that cellulose, and so we call that dietary rumpage or dietary fiber. This will pass right on through. This is a D, by the way. The final uh, sugar that I want to talk about, polysaccharide, I'd like to talk about, is this polysaccharide called chitin. Chitin is <coughs> got, it has these uh, glucose molecules that have been modified by the presence of an N-acetyl group. And so it's not glucose, it's actually called glucosamine. And glucosamine becomes the monomer that gets hatched together to a beta-1,4 glycosidic bond. And glycosid, or I'm sorry, the uh, chitin containing the glucosamine molecules becomes really very fibrous in structure. Um, and so we'll find kind of heavy concentrations in the exoskeletons of insects and also in some structural circumstances in fungi. So within the exoskeleton of insects and within the cell wall of fungi. Uh, again, the, the monomer here for this polymer is that modified glucose We're called glucosamine because of the end of the group, the lead containing group that is present in the in the molecule. Um, chitin was the for a long time, the go-to material to produce surgical sutures. So if you ever got stitches, it was probably cut <coughs> a long time ago. Now there's more synthetic materials that they use that are that are better, that help to uh, um, not be as, but they're more uh, aseptic, uh, sterile, better, better sterile materials. So real quick before we move on to lipids, just a reminder that sugars are important in storage for energy, they're important ingredients to build polymers, they're important uh, for developing certain types of structures such as cell walls, plants, fungi, and insect exoskeletons. We'll come back to Monomers, especially when we start talking about the production of ATP, which is energy currency for the cell. But before we can do that, I want to continue down the avenue of discussing the major macromolecules. And I want to begin with a second macromolecule called a lipid. Lipids, you also are going to probably hear referred to occasionally as fat. A lipid is really a molecule that has a high concentration of hydro, hydrophobic areas, or in other words, 
it exhibits a high level of hydrophobicity. Hydrophobic meaning what? Water. Water fear. So you take cooking oil and you pour it onto water, and what happens? You get two distinct layers. You get the oil layer and you get the water layer. And that oil layer doesn't mix well with the water because of the hydrophobic regions that are going to be present. And we're going to see that there's some additional variation that helps increase the diversity and form and function of lipids, especially when we begin to talk about things like plasma membranes that we're going to find surrounding the cell and then surrounding the individual organelle within eukaryotic cells. I want you to be aware of three different types of lipids. Those three different types of lipids, I said that lipids a lot of times we refer to as fats. That's actually one of the types. Fats are going to be one type of lipid, then the phospholipids, and the last is my favorite molecule category, which are the steroids. Not because I like the use of it's just because I really like the study skills. Now don't go home today and call your mom and say, Dr. Bowen admitted that he's a doper. Alright, so starting with the fats. Fats consist of two different chemical parts. Um, so here are examples of different types of see phospholipid down here, or fat, or fatty acids here, cholesterol is a type of, of steroid, triglyceride, and other fat. The fats in themselves are going to have two different chemical parts. One of the chemical parts is a molecule called glycerol. So we see the OL in there, and we know that glycerol has OH in it because it's an alcohol. You can see that glycerol looks very similar to some of the sugars that we've seen, but what you're going to notice is it has these three OHs. Thinking back on um, reactions, you may begin to think in terms of hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis reactions that may use these OHs. So glycerol can become a reactive molecule. The second part are the fatty acids. And a fatty acid is a chain of carbon atoms. So you can see here, glycerol and then our free fatty acids, oxygens at one side and then carbon at each point along the way. So a long chain of carbon, so there's skeleton, carbon skeleton that starts from, anyone happen to know what the chemical group is right here? Carbon and oxygen. Carboxyl. And that's the part of the molecule we determine or just dictate as being the head, so we call that the carboxyl head. Then the rest of the molecule is the tail of the molecule. And we're going to refer to that, because it contains hydrogens and carbons, as a hydrocarbon tail. Now, those hydrocarbon tails, I'm going to tell you something about carbon and hydrogen. So in each of these carbons, you have a bond to the next carbon and a bond to the previous carbon. And then you have a hydrogen coming off both sides, right? It's carbon, how many valence electrons in carbon? Four, how many bonding partners? Up to four. So we can add a hydrogen in both directions on all of these, okay? So carbon and hydrogen are going to be associated together. They're going to be in a relationship in this hydrocarbon tail. What you need to know about carbon and hydrogen is carbon and hydrogen have a near equal electronegativity. So 
what does that mean about this particular molecule? It's not polar. And that symbol right there, the three dots, just simply means there are four dots in the three. So because there's carbons and hydrogens, which are very close in their electronegativity, we distribute the electrons across those bonds relatively equally. We don't have a positive and a negative side. We're not polar. What is water? Polar or non-polar? It's polar. And the term for the uh, statement lights dissolve lights means that polar molecules dissolve polar molecules. If water is polar and the fatty acid tail, the hydrocarbon tail, is nonpolar, it's not going to dissolve well in water. And it's the chem that's the chemical reason, explanation for why pour some cooking oil on top of water, it sets up on top because it doesn't dissolve and associate well in that polar molecule of water. And there's an example of what I'm talking about. I'm sure you've all <coughs> seen that before. So we don't incorporate the two together. We allow the layers to be separate, non polar on top, polar on the bottom. The water binds preferentially to itself, which we know is already happening, right? Water binds to each other through hydrogen bonds. You have <laughs> one trillionth of a second interaction between the individual water molecules, between the hydrogen and oxygen, the polar sides of the water molecule. And that's the preference over binding to the fatty acid tail. When we take and put three fatty acids together, and they can be the same or they can be different, and we bind them to that glycerol molecule that has the three places that it can bind. So three fatty acids, they can be the same or they can be different, and they can be bound to the glycerol. We're going to bind them through what's called an ester linkage. And an ester linkage is what forms between the reaction of the carboxyl group and the hydroxyl group. Okay, so we're going to interact with the hydroxyl group and the carboxyl group forms an ester linkage. That particular molecule contains three fats. And I'm almost positive you've all heard of this molecule before. Anyone have a name for it? Three would be what? Tri. Tri triglyceride. There you go. <clears throat> Triacyl glycerol would be probably the most chemically accurate, but what we know most colloquially is going to be the triglyceride. And it's the triglyceride that basically becomes the building block for a lot of the fats that are required in biology. Now, this is the triglyceride right here, the triglyceride molecule. Here's our glycerol. We have that carbon-oxygen carbon bond, the ester linkage that was developed between the hydroxyl group and the carboxyl group. And again, each of these tails in blue can be different. They don't have to all be the same. One of them could be 18 carbons, one of them could be 16 car carbons. Uh, 
So anyways, you change the different levels um, and the different, uh, the different lengths of the carbon skeleton. You can also then change the, um, the location of the double bonds. Both of those things are going to add diversity. So you can create double bonds between some of the carbons in there. And you can create different numbers of those carbon bonds, uh, double double carbon bonds. You can change the location and you can change the overall length of the molecule and that's going to increase diversity. Now one of the things, one of the diverse characteristics that comes out of the um, addition or deletion or subtraction of double carbon bonds is that the molecule can be said to be saturated or unsaturated. Gary, I see you're struggling a little bit with something. Yeah. The, Roman the Roman numeral two? I actually am off just a little bit though, because this is still talking about fats. It probably should be two. And it should be the number two. Actually, I see really what I did. Um, fats probably should have been C, because phospholipids would then be D instead of. But yeah, this is still talking about that. Sorry about that. So let's talk about the diversity of fats. The diversity of fats, and we can, uh, and really of the triglyceride, and we can make different types of triglycerides by changing the lengths of the tails, the three different tails, changing the number and the location of the double bonds. Okay, when we change the the, the double bonds that are present, we change the overall structure. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to talk just a little bit about this in, um, here. This is known as the saturation, and you've all heard these terms before as well. You've heard of saturated, and you've heard of unsaturated fats. And those terms, saturated versus unsaturated, are a declaration of this diversity of lipids. So for a fat to be saturated, really what it means is every single carbon has four binding partners. Most of the time it's another carbon on either side and then going in the other direction, two hydrogens. Right, so if we were to draw out the chain, we would have hydrogens on all of those carbons. So this particular carbon right here binds to another carbon this way, binds to carbon this way, hydrogen and a hydrogen this way. So it's saturated because there's no additional bonds that I can produce. So a saturated triglyceride has no carbon carbon double bonds. Now, when that happens, as you can see here, the tails become very linear. When those tails are very linear, they pack tightly together. When we pack molecules when we pack molecules together, what do we get from a state of matter? A gas, a liquid, or a solid? Pack molecules tightly together. A solid. So saturated <coughs> triglycerides and saturated fats are solid, especially at room temperature. So butter and water, example here. 
So those molecules with no double carbon bonds, they're saturated, they become very linear to each other. They run very close to parallel. And because they're parallel, there's not any space like what you see over here. They pack tightly together and we get a solid. The term unsaturated. A molecule is deemed unsaturated if we have one or more carbon carbon double bonds. So now we have a situation where one of the hydrogens has to be lost because that sharing of atoms is shared now with the carbon in a double bond. So we lack some of our hydrogen. So now it's unsaturated because I still have another pair of electrons that could potentially be shared with another atom, uh, usually an atom of hydrogen. So that's the chemical explanation for the unsaturated fat. The physical properties of this double-double carbon bond is to create a kink. Whenever you have a double-double carbon bond, you end up with a kink in the chain. So no kinks in this chain here if it's saturated. Then we begin to add in kinks, which you can see here, because of the double, double carbon bond. The physical consequence of that double carbon bond forming a kink is now, as you can see in the small picture here, they can't pack this tightly together. Molecules that can't pack as tightly together have more freedom to move. They have more freedom to move, that's definitionally going to be a liquid. And so, our saturated, unsaturated fats, rather, are prevented from packing tightly together because of the kink that we find in the tails of those molecules allows a freedom to move that would indicate that we should be liquid at room temperature or more like a foil. Alright, so this is really a lot to do with digestive molecules, uh, molecules that we get from our, our digestion, uh, our diet rather, nutrition through digestion. The triglycerides, they'll end up in your bloodstream, they'll get packed away in adipose tissue. They do help out with some metabolic function. Uh, in fact, triglycerides are very important energy sources. Um, you should recognize by now that when we produce ATP, we preferentially use things like glucose or really glucose itself. But we can actually also utilize triglycerides and break down the carbon carbon tail, the carbon uh, hydrocarbon tails, to generate uh, another mo molecule called acetyl CoA. You're going to find out acetyl CoA goes right into the Krebs cycle and can be used to generate lots of ATP from a single molecule. So also metabolically, we can use these molecules. But where the triglyceride becomes vitally important for biology is what happens when I remove one of the hydrocarbon tails. And I free up that, uh, that carboxyl group to now be able to bind to something else. And in this case, if I bind it to a molecule containing a phosphate group, I can create a polar head with nonpolar tails. And I'm going to generate the ability chemically to produce plasma membranes, like the cell membrane that surrounds the cell. Those molecules are called phospholipids. We still have those hydrocarbon tails, and they're going to be nonpolar, and they can, can come in saturated and unsaturated forms. But one of those molecules here, uh, one of those uh, glycerol carbons frees up from a, it, it's, for its tail, we strap on a phosphate group, and now we have a polarized head, because there's many more oxygens in there. 
more electronegative, uh, higher electronegativity. To form the phospholipid, we're going to take that third hydroxyl group of glycerol and add on our phosphate group. And that phosphate group is going to be polar. We're actually going to have a charge. And the phosphate group, with its little charge and its reactive oxygen, can bind additional molecules. So because we can bind those other molecules, and it doesn't always have to be the same molecule, it's additional diversity for our phospholipids. Now, up to this point, the fatty acids, free fatty acids, and the triglycerols, uh, they were all nonpolar molecules. By adding on this polar molecule, we're going to get a molecule that acts even, uh, even more different. That's probably not the best English, but I'm a biologist, so I'm going to just go with it. It's going to act different than the nonpolar molecules. And we're going to begin to get additional structural function from these molecules. The, the big chemical characteristic that comes out is called ambivalent. <clears throat> and really, this is a reference to the fact that this molecule is going to have the polarity. It's going to have the nonpolar hydrophobic tails, and it's going to have the polar hydrophilic head. What is the, the increased PL? Increase in phospholipid variety. So because I can put different types of molecules on here, Olivia, I get all different types of new molecules that I can produce. It's more and more diversity. So the head is going to be <clears throat> hydrophilic, water-loving, interacts well with water. The tails are going to remain hydrophobic and will want to be away from, will want to be away from water. So if I take a bunch of phospholipids and I throw them into water, we formed two distinct layers when it was just the triglycerides. Now we actually can form what's known as a bilayer. And the bilayer is going to be accomplished by swinging all of those hydrocarbon tails, the hydrophobic region of the molecule inward to face each other where they are now protected from the water, allowing the heads of those molecules to be exposed to the water environment. So the polar head goes with the water, faces the water, interacts with the water. The nonpolar head, I'm sorry, nonpolar tails rather, are going to avoid the water. And this becomes the chemical basis to produce biological membranes, such as the cell membrane, the membranes that we find around all of our different organelle in the cell. All right, one final type of lipid to briefly introduce you to. And these are called the steroids. The steroids are all generated from the molecule known as cholesterol. They are exemplified by carbon rings. So all of these will have carbon rings. All of them will be generated from steroids, I'm sorry, cholesterol rather. 
And in fact, we're going to find that there are four carbon rings in each of these molecules. Four carbon skeleton rings. And then we'll attach on different functional groups, which will again add to the steroids diversity as a group of lipids. So we have the four carbon skeleton rings, one, two, three, four, and then a variety of different functional groups that can be attached. And you will recognize a lot of the steroids. Cholesterol, obviously, you probably recognize, which is our base or our parent product, and it generates things like progesterone and testosterone and estrogens, dihydrotestosterone, dihydroendosterone, all of these that are very popular among bodybuilders and athletes who are kind of doing All right, so cholesterol is going to be our parent product, and we're actually going to find cholesterol itself, which most of you would think most likely that cholesterol is bad and you shouldn't get a lot of cholesterol. And really the statement is not entirely true. Excessive amounts of cholesterol is bad. But cholesterol is actually vital for living systems. Cholesterol ends up in the cell membrane. And it becomes a very important part of that cell membrane. It will also act as, again, as I've mentioned, the steroid origins. And I've given you all of the sex steroids, but it also will produce the mineral and glucocorticoids, which are a whole other set of steroids. So why is the cholesterol so important? We're going to come back to it when we start to talk about lipids, but just to kind of get you to think ahead just a little bit. If I have a lipid bilayer that has completely saturated hydrocarbon tails, you all should now agree that that lipid bilayer is going to become more and more like a solid because those molecules can pack tightly together, right? Solid membranes are not really that good at being selectively permeable bilayers. So it's really nice if we can actually space the molecules out a little bit more and regulate how far they're spaced out and kind of keep them within this optimal range. In other words, if they're packed too close, closely together, they become a solid and the membrane doesn't work that well. If they're packed too far apart because of large amounts of saturation, The molecule acts more <coughs> like a liquid, or really liquid. And really, we want it someplace in between. We want it kind of right at this optimal level where it's a nice mix of being solid and liquid at the same time, more like a gel rather than completely solid or completely liquid. So we can alter the number of carbon double bonds that we would find, carbon-carbon double bonds, which help out just a little bit. But as you can imagine, that could potentially allow the molecules to spread out enough to be more liquid than we really would want them to be. So we can actually also begin to incorporate cholesterol. Okay. Anyways, I can begin to incorporate cholesterol into the lipid bilayers into the membranes, and cholesterol acts basically to hold the lipids so that they're not too far apart and they're not too close together. It helps control them to be right in kind of that <coughs> optimal distance to form a not too liquid, not too solid cell membrane. What happens if you cool down a substance? Like I take Devante's water here, I put it in the freezer, 
it becomes a solid, right? If I were to cool down a cell membrane, do you think it could become more and more solid? Yeah, lipids can become solid if we reduce their temperature. We remove a lot of heat. So think about organisms that live, let's say, up on the, um, the tundra in the Arctic. In the winter time, caribou have to be able to walk across frozen ground for like six months out of the year at really, really freezing cold temperatures, yet their foot pad, the cells in their foot pad, remain relatively healthy during that whole process. So not only is the lipid bilayer controlled by cholesterol, but what happens if I increase or decrease the amount of cholesterol that's present? I can begin to modify how solid or how, how liquid the membrane becomes, right? And when temperatures start to drop, and I have this propensity to become more and more solid just because of the loss of temperature, I pop in more cholesterol. And that helps to maintain the, the lipid bilayer, the membrane, at an optimal state of construction. Caribou are really good at doing that. In fact, a lot of Arctic wildlife is really good at modifying their cholesterol levels. Humans less so. That's why we they have the chemistry to do it. They have enzymes that help to uh, regulate cholesterol levels and help to put the cholesterol into the membrane. So the cholesterol doesn't come from what they eat? You have both genetic, and, and, uh, which is called a hereditary source, and then dietary source as well. Um, and a lot of those organisms know it's not coming in real high, high amounts from what they're eating. There's not a lot of cholesterol in the grass. They have chemical abilities to produce it from other starting <coughs> other starting materials. Right. About ten more minutes here. Um, I'm just going to begin to touch on our second. Well, really, it's our third and our fourth. Macromolecules. So we talked about carbohydrates and saccharides, and we talked about lipids. What are the next two proteins? Talk about carbohydrates, saccharides. It's language of life. DNA. What is DNA? It's a nucleoside. So you can start a brand new lecture and what we're going to begin with are the proteins and it's the proteins that are responsible for physiology. Proteins are still considered macromolecules correct? Say that again? Proteins are still considered macromolecules correct? Proteins are, are actually not in, they're made up of a macromolecule called an amino acid. Okay. So really, the, the macromolecules would be the carbohydrates or the saccharides, which are used to produce polysaccharides, such as nitrogen, cellulose, glycogen. Lipids are, they don't follow that monomer polymer um, convention. So on their own, a lipid, cholesterol is a steroid. The phospholipids would be the individual macromolecules. <coughs> DNA is not a macromolecule. DNA is produced by nucleotides, which are the macromolecules. And proteins are not macromolecules. They're produced by the macromolecule called But it's the protein, this chain of amino acids organized into a specific structure that gives us and confers the physiological function. So one of the things that you need to get in your brain right now is that proteins confer physiology. The other thing that you need to know is if you change the shape of a protein, you change the physiology of the organism. And the way to change proteins is to bind stuff to them, to pass electricity by them, or change voltage. So there's a variety of ways to change the protein's structure and those things really change in the physiological function of the cell. 
So what do proteins confer? Physiology. Physiology. The place I want to begin with proteins is discussing the structure. The protein is the polymer. And really, the, the term protein refers to a really big version of the polymer. There are smaller versions of polymers that are called polypeptides. So amino acids get strapped together into polypeptides. Some polypeptides on their own can constitute a protein, but other polypeptides have to associate with still other polypeptides to form a final protein. Hemoglobin is a perfect example. Hemoglobin, you all should be familiar with, carries oxygen in the red blood cell. Hemoglobin consists of four polypeptides. Hemoglobin is a protein. The four polypeptides are two alpha chains and two beta chains. The basic structure, and really when I say basic structure, I'm basically saying the language of proteins is amino acids. Right, the language of the saccharides was things like glucose and fructose and glucose, those individual monomers, the building blocks, are what we use to build the larger molecules. <laughs> so we have amino acids, which you can call the monomers of proteins. And there are 20 amino acids, and things like alanine, tyrosine, phenylalanine, cysteine, methionine. All of these are amino acids. And they're amino acids based off of their chemical structure. They have a carboxyl group on one side, which we call the C terminus. So if, let's find a really simple one. So if you look at the molecule, you basically have one carbon molecule that's going to be right in the middle. And coming off of that carbon molecule, you are going to have a amino group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, and then what's called the R group. And the R group is what changes. If you look at all of these molecules, they basically have a similarity until you begin to build the R group. So here's the R group down here towards the bottom. Hydrogen and alanine, and as we move over here towards tryptophan, we get the two carbon rings coming off as our R group. But everything here around that central carbon is basically all the same. Okay? So the, the basic structure here is to have a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, and a mean group, which is the namesake for the molecule, and then what's called the R, and it's the R that changes. <coughs> so for each individual amino acid, I'm going to abbreviate amino acid. This is AA, not alcohols anonymous. Amino acid. They are differentiated based off of their side chain, which is called their R group. If you know this structure, you know the base all 20 of the amino acids. And then if you put in here for the R, the hydrogen, then you get alanine. If you change it out, you put on this ring here, now it's pro. Okay? So the basic structure is all very similar. It's the R group that changes it. But the R group becomes important because it's sort of like a functional group. Different R groups act differently from a physiological biological perspective. So we have our individual amino acids with their distinct side chains creating distinct physiological function. The polymer is going to be the polypeptide. And then in some cases, individual polypeptides equate to protein, but in a lot of cases, you need two or more individual polypeptides to generate a protein. 
polypeptide is a chain of individual amino acids. So these amino acids, we can connect them together, and we're going to connect them together in a peptide bond. So if I want to begin to build a polypeptide, I'm going to begin to put individual amino acids together forming a peptide bond. A little bit later in the semester, we're going to get to a process called translation. Translation extracts the genetic information from the DNA through a molecule called messenger RNA. It uses the information contained in that messenger RNA molecule to guide what amino acid needs to be connected next to a growing polypeptide chain to a peptide bond. All right, so here are individual amino acids, each with a distinct R group, and we're just not going to really uh, identify the R groups for now. So I got my carboxyl group on one side, and I got my amine group on the other side, and what you'll see is that I'm going to use water, or I'm going to remove water to form that polypeptide bond. What kind of reaction is it? Dehydration synthesis. And that peptide bond through that dehydration synthesis reaction, which requires an enzyme, is going to utilize the carboxyl group attached to the amine group. So carboxyl group, amino group, interact. Water is pulled out and it allows that bond to form. So here's my amino group, here's my carboxyl group. Take my two hydrogens and my oxygen produce the water. And so down here, I should see a combination or a bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, which is exactly what I see. Now, what's left over at the polypeptide ends is an open amino group in an open carboxyl group. We refer to the ends based off of their polarity, right? They're polar because one side of the molecule of this peptide, polypeptide, is going to be the terminus, or the uh, carboxyl group called the C terminus. The other side will be the amino group called, uh, that we refer to as the N terminus. So we have an N terminus and we have a C terminus. Which reference the free amino uh, amino N terminal side and the free carboxyl C terminal side. All right, we're we're all done. We'll pick up on Friday and we'll start talking about protein confirmation. As you are packing up, I want to put in a, a word of advice for you in your labs. Uh, I've been informed that. Many of you, I don't know who exactly it is, many of you are missing big chunks of the lab. Make sure you're cleaning out the whole lab. Make sure you do the whole lab. That's where you're going to gain a lot of points. So if you got a 85 on the last exam and you want to get an A in class, you can make a lot of that up because you do the labs completely and well. All right? So make sure that you're doing that. <laughs> really got it. <laughs> yeah, it's just
Let me know. I'm I am so far behind right now. But I'm gonna say probably not. Um, if you can maybe hook up with someone in class on the that would probably be the best approach. See ya. Okay. 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 Is that people that are really mean? Yeah. They they take away the take away the oxygen from the carboxyl group. They're so mean. <laughs> carboxyl, that's the middle aged group and terminus is the whole <laughs> Everything I need to know about worldview I learned from chemistry.